Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Sri Krishnamurti from Quant University. This is the the most exciting time of the year, I guess, with holidays coming in, and uh, we are wrapping up our fall series next week. And today we have Ian Coward from the University of Washington, who recently wrote an amazing paper on the unified framework for model explanation, talking about explainable AI and sharing some of the research work he has been doing with Scott Lundberg and Swinley at the University of Washington and, and at Microsoft. Um, so uh, I welcome you all to today's workshop. So today's workshop is an hour and a half. So Ian is gonna be walking us through the, the paper and his research and also sharing an example, which uh, we have posted on the Q Sandbox and it's also available for people who are dialed in on the link and I'll be posting it later for people to review. So uh, for people who don't know us, we are Quant University. We've been doing these workshops um, since COVID hit in an online mode. And um, one of the things we have tried to do is bring in the research community, the practitioner community and the academic community to kind of come together and talk about some of the uh, important developments which has happened, which has been happening in the area of machine learning and pragmatic approaches of using machine learning in industrial settings. And today I'm just gonna give you a brief introduction to what Pont University does, and then I'll hand off the stage to Ian. So we started out in 2013 as an advisory. We focus on the intersection of data science, machine learning, and finance. Uh, we're based out of Boston, and uh, we have done a lot of uh, workshops in a B2B mode for various companies and organizations. Then in the last nine months, we have taken all our workshops online so that people can um, register and they can watch all our sessions online. We have had people from 13 different countries uh, take and uh, join our workshops. And I welcome all of you who are joining us new today. And uh, in the fall workshop series, we have had multiple courses in machine learning, uh, data science, model risk management, and we are continuing that in winter with uh, multiple lectures and also some new courses. So if you're interested in taking or learning about some of the trends in using AI and machine learning in the context of finance, please go to cubeinterschool.com. And next week is gonna be the last lecture on, uh, of this year. It's on December 22nd. And uh, we have a theme on alternative data and the AI uh, or the, rather the API jungle as a lot of data vendors have basically API-fied their offerings. So we have invited um, Brad Franklin from uh, Faxit and uh, James Perkins from Refinitiv and uh, Jakob Weinstock, uh, who's also a CFA charter holder uh, is going to be uh, joining us. And we're gonna have a discussion on how organizations are leveraging different APIs and how does the API ecosystem look and uh, we're gonna have a bunch of different demos we can, we can discuss in next week's session. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ian. Ian uh, is a PhD student in computer science at the University of Washington. Uh, he works in machine learning with his advisor, Sue and Lee. His research focuses on finding rigorous foundations on explainable AI, particularly as it relates to game theory and information theory. Uh, he's previously been a student researcher at Google AI Health and a quantitative research intern at Goldman Sachs and Associated Teaching Rawls. So he can bring in some of the uh, finance related aspects or maybe answer some questions in the financial related aspects too. So last week we had uh, Dr. Raghuz Sujianto from uh, Wells Fargo uh, do an amazing workshop on interpretable machine learning and uh, looking at some of the research and the open source package Elite here, which, uh, uh, which uh, Raghuz introduced. And uh, this week we're gonna talk about explainable AI and uh, Ian's research. Okay, so for people who are interested in getting slides in the video, just go to Q Academy and uh, you'll be able to search there. Uh, but without further ado, I would like to hand over the stage to Ian. Ian, please take it away. All right, thank you. Um, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Does that look all right? Yes, we can see your screen, yeah. 
Okay, great. Well, uh, hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, like Shri said, uh, I'm Ian Covert. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington. And the title of this talk is Explaining by Removing a Unified Framework for Model Explanation. And there you go. Um, it's actually the title of our recent paper. Uh, it's a paper that I wrote with my advisor, Sue Ann Lee, and Scott Lundberg, who's a former student of Sue Ann Lee. Um, and if you find this talk interesting, you might consider just uh, reading the whole paper, but fair warning, it's a little bit long. Um, so here's a roadmap for the talk. We are more or less gonna track the contents of the paper with a demonstration in the middle. Um, but before uh, jumping into the contents, I'll start off by motivating this area of research a little bit. So with modern machine learning, uh, black box models are becoming increasingly popular. And we've moved towards these, you know, I'm talking about neural networks, um, tree-based models like XGBoost. We've moved towards them because they offer better performance and oftentimes that's essential. But there are concerns about the idea of relying on models um, whose predictions we can't understand. Um, now, explainable AI is a field that uh, offers tools that provide a solution to this problem, the transparency problem. And uh, these tools um, will provide some, some degree of uh, transparency into how a model works, how it makes predictions, maybe it's internal logic. And explainable AI is becoming more important as machine learning becomes more widespread. But um, when you train a black box model and you need to provide transparency to users or to people in your organization, uh, you'll confront this question, which methods uh, should you rely on? And when you look into this, you'll figure out that you have a lot of options. Uh, there are hundreds of explainability papers and every method will give you a different answer about how the model works. And with so many options, it's not easy to navigate the literature. Uh, you don't have to read everything on this list. The point is just that there are a lot. Um, uh, so this made us ask ourselves, is the field in a good place? You know, is explainable AI in a good place? And the first thing to say is, um, this is an important problem and researchers have responded to it. They've made a lot of progress in a pretty short amount of time, but we should also acknowledge some problems. So the field is fragmented. There are hundreds of papers and they're all over the place. Um, every method kind of seems unique, unrelated to other methods. Um, the field is just disorganized and it makes it kind of impossible to navigate. <clears throat> it's also growing very fast. So new papers are being published basically every day. And I guess that's faster than um, almost anyone can keep up with it. Maybe a dedicated academic could um, <clears throat> dedicate a lot of time to keeping up with all the papers, but if you're a practitioner, this is kind of unmanageable. Um, and uh, one of the big underlying problems is that there isn't enough discussion about the underlying principles that connect uh, large classes of methods. You know, a lot of people wanna write a paper and introduce their new method because it does something a little bit different than um, some other methods, but there isn't a lot of incentive to talk about how different methods are maybe implicitly doing the same things. And uh, I think that's a big reason the field is so fragmented. So with this talk, we will try to fix some of those problems. And the first thing we'll talk about is a new uh, unifying theory that characterizes uh, over 20 existing explanation methods. It, it makes it really easy to understand all these methods at once, and we'll see how they're related. And with this perspective, I hope that when you now look at Lime or you look at SHAP, uh, you no longer see a complicated monolithic algorithm, but you'll see that all these methods are very similar and they're basically just making interchangeable choices. They all belong to one family. And uh, in doing so, we're gonna delve into one key idea, one underlying idea about how to explain machine learning models. So, with that, let's jump into talking about what this framework is. So explaining by removing, it's, uh, we thought it was a catchy phrase, it's the title of our paper, but what does it mean? So we observed that, uh, you know, as I've begun doing research in this area, I've read 
many papers, and as I've learned about more and more of these papers, um, I observed and I talked to Scott about this, it seemed like many methods were implicitly simulating feature removal, kind of imagining how the model's predictions change when you deprive the model of certain features. Um, but feature removal is actually a non-trivial operation. Um, the API of most models uh, requires all the features, so you can't just not give them access to certain features. Um, so there are different approaches to simulating feature removal. But for all these methods, after you know, they decide how they're going to remove features, there are further differences in how they generate the final explanation. With Shaft, you're calculating Shapley values. With Lime, you're fitting a linear model. With uh, different methods, there are different techniques. So <clears throat> there's a lot of diversity in these methods, um, despite the fact that they all rely on feature removal. And uh, so we kind of challenged ourselves by asking, you know, can we make one framework that captures all of these methods, that captures all these differences? And here's the framework that we designed or discovered. It shows that all these methods are determined by different combinations of three choices. So it's sort of a three-dimensional framework. The recipe for a new explanation method is you just have to make these three choices. All right, so what are the choices? The first one is about feature removal. How do you remove features from a model that requires all of the features? Like if you think about uh, a neural network, you can't just not give it access to certain features. If you want to remove certain features, you could maybe replace them with the default values, or you could maybe marginalize them out, or you could maybe try to blur that part of the image. If it's an image, that's the input. Uh, there are different ways of trying to simulate feature removal. The second choice is the model behavior that you want to explain. So as you're removing different features, the model is going to make different predictions. And you could look at just an individual prediction, how it changes as different features are removed. Or you could look at the model's loss on that individual prediction. Or you could look at <coughs> the expected loss across the data set as different groups of features are removed. And there are different um, behaviors that you can explain. And this, this uh, like flexibility in this respect lets us lump even more methods into this class. OK, the third choice is a summary technique. Um, and so, so let's imagine that you can remove individual features. right? But you can also remove groups of two features. And you can remove groups of three features. Um, with all of the different sets of features that you can remove, there's an exponential number of subsets. right? And that's what, uh, in the top of this diagram, we're trying to show. You can see how the model's behavior changes as you remove an exponential number of different sets of features. Um, but that's too much information to convey to a person. If there are 100 features, you can't communicate to them two to 100 numbers. So every one of these methods basically has this third choice. It's a summary technique for how you collapse all of that down into something simple, maybe feature attributions, one score for each feature that you can just give to the user give them a little insight. So <clears throat> this is our framework, three dimensions, three choices. It's the recipe for creating a new explanation method. But there are also like 25 explanation methods that just make three choices. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, but first, let's look at each of these choices just a little bit more closely. So <clears throat> when it comes to feature removal, you probably have a model. Maybe it's a neural network. Maybe it's an XGBoost model. And it requires a specific set of features, right? And you can think of that as a function that has an output for every x in the input domain. So we're trying to show here. Um, now, to, to um, imagine how the model behaves given subsets of features when you're holding out like the age feature or you're holding out the credit score feature, we introduced the notion of a subset function that accepts not a whole feature vector, but a subset of it. And the notation we use is this. Capital F is a function, a subset function, that takes S sub S, where um, that's basically, you know, if X is a vector, it's the dimensions that are specified by the subset S. That's a subset of 
1 through D, the feature indices, their D features. So it's kind of introducing a lot of notation at once, but hopefully that makes sense. Most functions don't work like this. You can't just give them access to a subset of features. So this is something we had to define, but it's kind of a nifty tool. <coughs> okay, so that's uh, all we'll say about feature removal uh, for now. Um, when it comes to the model behavior, so here's the idea. Given access to all the features, in this case, these four features, the model will make certain predictions. But all right, get ready for this animation. When you remove a couple features, the output changes. The model makes different predictions now. But to run one of these explanation methods, you need to choose the target quantity that you're looking at, the target quantity to explain. And some different options are you can look at how an individual prediction changes. So for an individual uh, x vector, we can look at how the you know, classification probability for uh, defaulting on a loan goes up and down as different features are removed. And notice that this is, um, it's a set function. The input to this function is a subset. And um, <clears throat> the output in this case is just the prediction for that set of features, right? But there's some different options. You can also look at the loss for, uh, a, for an XY pair. Right, I'm just wrapping a loss function around that, maybe mean squared error, maybe cross entropy loss if it's a classification task. And you can also look at the data set loss, the average loss across uh, the entire data set. And you'll notice that all of these, all three of these are set functions. They're functions, you give them a set, and the value that's returned represents the model's behavior given that set of features. Okay, and lastly, there's the summary technique. So remember in the previous slide, we showed that um, once you choose a model behavior, you are implicitly choosing a set function that um, you know for any set of features, it returns a value that represents the model's behavior given that set of features, right? Um, if, if we think about this a little more abstractly, the set of features can kind of be like a set of employees working for a company. And for every set of employees, there's a certain amount of profit. Um, so with all the employees or all the features, there's a certain profit. But if you remove a couple employees, the profit changes. You remove a couple more employees, the profit changes again. Um, and you can look at every subset of employees, but how are you going to communicate that to a user to say something about every employee's contribution to the profit? or in our case, every feature's contribution to the model's predictions or its loss. So the role of the explanations is to provide a concise summary of the, this uh, underlying set function. And we distinguish between two types of summaries. Um, the first one is a feature attribution. So think of like, Lime or Shap or a lot of methods basically give a score to each feature, and the score indicates uh, that feature's role, maybe its importance or its influence, or how much it drives the prediction up or how much it drives the prediction down. Um, but a lot of methods do feature attributions. They give a score to each feature. And if you're wondering how you might calculate attributions, here are a couple simple examples. Uh, one thing you could do is for the first employee, maybe his score could be defined as the difference between the profitability with all the employees and the profitability with all the employees minus him. Um, or, you know, swap in features. It's the model's prediction with all the features, but the difference between that and the model's prediction with all the features minus him. And we'll call that the remove individual uh, summary technique. That's what we call it in the paper, at least. And a bunch of methods do that, uh, like really handful of methods do that. Um, alternatively, here's another very intuitive thing you could do. You could look at the difference between none of the employees and none of the employees plus this one. Um, that's another way of quantifying that employee's contribution. Um, but the point is there are different options. There are different ways of generating feature attributions. Um, 
Now, alternatively, instead of doing attributions, the explanation could do feature selection. It could just output an influential set of features. These are the most important features. Um, and what that would look like is, you know, we'd say maybe these three features or these three employees are the most influential. <coughs> So uh, now that we've talked about the framework and we've described the three choices um, that uh, you need to make in this, in this recipe, uh, we can talk about how a couple existing methods fit into the framework. And you'll see that it's uh, really easy to um, just like walk through the literature and take a paper and distill it down to three choices. Here is, here's what this method is. It's that simple. It's just boom, boom, boom. Um, but maybe before we do that, um, do, does anyone have any questions? And um, since I don't I'm see any questions, Ian, but I'm um, I'm also watching both the LinkedIn and the chat panel. If there are any questions, I'll bring it up. Okay, <clears throat> I'll give it a second and have a sip of tea. I think one comment by Michaela looks like the uh, methodology disregards the employee interaction with respect to interaction terms. Oh yeah, well, these these two techniques do ignore employee interactions. These are very simple approaches. Um, they're kind of computationally appealing um, because it's it's really simple, right? For each employee, you just need to see. You know, you just need to look at the profitability with all the employees. And then for each employee, you look at the profitability when they are discluded. So it's pretty quick to calculate these attributions. But yes, conceptually, they have some shortcomings. I would not uh, necessarily advocate for these. Um, not to do too much of a spoiler, but the generalization of this and this that has much better properties and it does um, account for interactions is the Shapley value. But that's pretty hard to make a diagram of. So I just wanted to give a couple simple examples for now. Are there any other more, uh, any more comments or should I? No, on? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, I'm great. Well, uh, if anything, I'll interrupt you. Yeah, okay, well, uh, thank you for that one. Um, okay, so we'll start off with Lime. This is a pretty famous method. So if you're into explainability, I'm sure you've heard of it. And there's a whole paper about it, but we are gonna distill it down to the three choices that Lime makes, how it fits into this framework. So I'm gonna spare you the equations just in the interest of uh, being able to go through a couple of these. But if you're really interested, check out the paper, all the math is there. So when it comes to feature removal, Lime, at least for images, when it tries to remove certain pixels or super pixels, it replaces them with default values. It'll just turn it gray or turn it black. That's how it holds out features. When it comes to the model behavior, Lime is looking at an individual prediction. We're just looking at the classification probability for um, an image of a dog, for example. <clears throat> and that's one they do in the paper. And for the summary technique, Lime fits a linear model to its underlying set function. And you probably knew that Lime fit a linear model, but to say that it fits a linear model to its set function might appear a little bit confusing. And that's because it does this like sampling thing in practice, but in the limit of an infinite number of samples, you can see that Lime is uh, really just approximating uh, an optimal linear model fit to its underlying set function. So whole paper about Lime, but this boils it down to the three choices that it makes. Okay, now SHAP is a paper that came out a year later. This one's maybe even more famous. I'm sure you've heard of it. We're going to, again, distill the whole paper down to three, three little choices. So the first one is when features are removed, SHAP, unlike Lime, marginalizes them out using some distribution. Again, sparing you the, the equations, but SHAP basically says, we don't know these features, Okay, well, maybe we have a distribution over these features and we can imagine um, drawing the features from their distribution and then averaging the model's prediction over that distribution. 
maybe that's a better approach than just using default values because they're you know gray gray pixels and images aren't completely neutral they mean something to the model um, so maybe maybe this is a better idea when it comes to the model behavior that's being explained it's an individual prediction just like lime um, for the summary technique shap calculates the shapley values of its underlying set function and i'm a big fan of the shapley value but we i, I won't be going into that too much today um, i'd say check out the paper if you want to see details about what the shapley value is okay sage is a method that <clears throat> me and these same collaborators introduced earlier this year it's a little bit like shap but it's for saying um, you know, we want to know features importance, not for an individual prediction, but across the entire data set. It's sort of like we want to know how much information each feature contributes. So again, we're just going to distill it down to three choices. The first one is to remove features, they're marginalized out, just like SHAP. For the model behavior that's being explained, this time it's the data set loss. It's the model's performance across the entire data set. So when we remove um, the age feature, for example, we will remove the age feature from every row in the data set and we'll make predictions for now every row in the data set minus the age feature and we'll evaluate the loss and then take the average. And presumably as you remove features that the model relies on, Every time you remove another feature, the model's performance is going to get a little bit worse. Right. And then we want to summarize each feature's uh, contribution to making the model's performance good. And the summary technique that we use for Sage is again the Shapley value. So the same as Shap. So with this perspective, we're seeing that a lot of these methods are um, kind of like iterations on existing methods. And uh, here's just one more. Permutation tests. This so, is a. In, this, in the prior example, uh, uh, Ian, huh? how does the variety of data which is being used kind of get factored? So, for example, if you have sparse data sets, what, how does that matter? <clears throat> Do you mean um, like there are missing values in the data set or the model's dependencies? Like the model has a sparse dependence on different features, like some features just don't matter? Uh, the latter. Oh, um, <clears throat> yes. So if the model truly does not depend on many features, then what you would expect to see is that the Shapley values, which the, this is, um, it's doing feature attribution. Every feature gets a score and the score represents how much that feature improves the model's performance. So in this case, as with really many of these methods, if the model truly does not depend on a feature, you would expect it to have a very low score, maybe a score of zero, um, if, it, if it truly has sparse dependencies like that, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so lastly, permutation tests. Um, this is an older method. I uh, don't know if you've heard of this one, but we're gonna see that it's really kind of similar to Sage. Um, for removing features, they're marginalized out, just like Sage, just like Shap. Um, for the model behavior that's being explained, it's the data set loss. So you remove features and you see how much the model's accuracy goes down, same as Sage. But for the summary technique, um, permutation tests will say, you know, for the age feature, here's how you calculate the score for age. Look at the accuracy with all the features, maybe 90% accurate. Now look at the accuracy when we remove the age feature. Age might provide valuable information. So maybe, maybe the accuracy plummets by 10% down to 80%. And age now looks pretty important. Maybe we'll give it a score of um, 0.1 because that's how much the accuracy drops by. So it uses this remove individual summary technique. It's uh, what I used this little cartoon for a couple slides ago. And like the commenter mentioned, uh, this does fail to account for interactions of each feature with every other feature. It's computationally appealing. That's one of the downsides, you know, the difference between Sage and permutation tests. 
the most important one is that uh, Sage uses the Shapley value or his permutation test, just remove individual features. And th there's like a conceptual trade-off. Maybe Shapley values are uh, communicating a better uh, summary of how the model works, but they're also harder to calculate. So those are the kinds of trade-offs you encounter with each of these choices. So that's uh, the last of the methods that I wanted to walk through. Um, <clears throat> I guess if there are any more comments, uh, shout them out, Shri. Um, but yeah, we not helping yet. All right. Um, so we went through this that process that we just went through, where we looked at a paper and we tried to see, you know, is this? Um, we call them removal-based explanations. By the way, that's uh, the name we have for this class of methods that can be expressed by this framework. We call them removal-based explanations. We went through this process over and over for a lot of papers, and we figured out in the end that there are at least 20 methods that can be characterized in this way. And this table uh, shows them every row is a different method. And uh, the different columns are the three choices that they make. And here we're just showing it in words. Uh, hope, hopefully it's pretty intuitive. But uh, in the paper, we also give equations because some of these are not super straightforward. Um, but yeah, it's pretty exciting. It really seems to be a unifying framework because you know there's more than 20 methods out there but it's a pretty appreciable chunk of the literature. And this includes um, you know, many of the most widely used methods. So <clears throat> pretty exciting. And it also includes both uh, local explanation methods and global explanation methods. If you haven't heard those terms before, local usually means that um, <clears throat> you're explaining an individual prediction. Why did this guy uh, get denied his loan, or why is this patient sick? With global explanations, you're saying something across the entire data set. It's not focused on uh, w one prediction. Um, so we have both local and global methods in here. We also have methods that do feature attribution and feature selection. And I know I mentioned that before, but the point is this is connecting pretty disparate parts of the literature. It's often pretty hard to talk about these kinds of methods at the same time because they do such different things. But our framework has just enough flexibility to bring um, all these things together. <clears throat> so uh, another interesting thing that you can do is you can sort of visualize the literature. That's what we do here. And you can think of this as like the space of methods. So along the vertical axis, we have uh, the different feature removal strategies so you can um, just replace them with zeros. You can replace the held out features with default values. You can, for example, blur the image. There are different ways of marginalizing out the missing features. That's the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, we have the different summary techniques. Some of them are attributions. Some of them are feature selections. And we colorize to show the different model behaviors that are being explained. Um, and we put all those methods from the table into this grid. And this is cool because you can see their neighboring methods, methods that are uh, doing almost the same things because they're in the same row or the same column or maybe even the same box. Um, and you know, with the methods that are kind of spatially isolated, you know that they're unique. Um, with the grid cells that are empty, you know that those are new methods that just haven't been tried yet. They're hybrids between existing methods, but they are trivial to implement. These choices are really interchangeable. The method won't mean the same thing exactly, but any empty cell here could just be a new method. And well, it would be, it would be kind of fun if over the years, uh, <laughs> this kind of got filled out if like people decided that different methods are good ideas. Um, but in the paper, we do we actually run a couple experiments where we try to fill out a big chunk of this and just look at a couple properties of the different methods. So, okay, <clears throat> now that we've walked through the framework and we've seen how a couple methods fit into it, we'll uh, do a quick demonstration. Um, 
I could pause for questions now, but I feel like there aren't going to be any because I asked a couple just a couple minutes ago. Yeah, I don't think Is there that... are any questions. You can go ahead. Okay, cool. So with this demo, I'm just going to give you a little preview of what we're going to try to do. So the paper comes with a GitHub repository. We call it the removal explanations repo. And <clears throat> about this implementation. So our goal was to make a very simple, lightweight, modular implementation that lets you run many of the methods that we've been talking about. And the goal isn't necessarily to replace the original implementations because sometimes they actually do tricks that will generate the explanations faster. But our goal is to show that uh, because these methods are so similar with very little code, you can implement almost all of them. Um, so that's the goal of our repository. Could be interesting to, to check out. And we're gonna use it right now to show off a couple examples. The focus is gonna be um, for one model, it's really easy to just interchange these choices and run a different explanation method. Uh, that's what we're gonna try to show uh, right now. So let's see if I can smoothly switch over to... Uh, Shri, are you seeing the notebook right now? Uh, yes, we can see it properly. Okay, great. <clears throat> uh, would you mind doing like a, you know, control plus plus so that we can see the font a little bit bigger? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> So with this notebook, we are gonna be using um, the code from that repository. Um, and the goal is to implement. Uh, uh, and, uh, or, can I just make an announcement? I just put in the link on the, the chat window. So if anybody wants to follow along, you can just go to the page and uh, click on um, you know, run on Q sandbox and you should be able to follow along the collab notebook. Awesome. <clears throat> So yeah, the goal is to show how easy it is <coughs> to run um, a number of different explanation methods just by interchanging little choices. So we don't need to have one repository for SHAP and a different repository for uh, a different method. Um, we can just make the three choices and we can easily change this choice or change this choice. That's what we'll try to do. Okay. so. <coughs> What are we going to focus on, though? Um, we're going to be looking at a model that's trained on the MNIST data set. So we're um, <clears throat> classifying digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Um, and recall that the framework um, shows that each explanation method has to make three choices. Uh, our goal is going to be to try a couple different options just to see what the explanations look like. Um, when it comes to feature removal, <clears throat> There are, of course, a bunch of different options. We're actually only going to look at one way of removing features here. And it's one that you maybe haven't thought of. We're going to train a model that at training time has missing features. So it's sort of like we're going to mask out features during training. And the effect is that the model has to do the best that it can given the features that it does have access to. And this is a little bit different, by the way, than uh, training a model with all the features and then masking them out because in that case the model doesn't really know what masking means. Um, so introducing the masking at, at training time is an option uh, and that's what we're going to do here. And when it comes to the model behaviors that we'll be explaining, uh, we are going to look at two different options. We're going to explain individual predictions and the loss for individual predictions. And for this third choice, the summary techniques, we're gonna look at three. Um, removing individual features, like we showed in the slides, including individual features, like we showed in the slides, and the Shapley value, <coughs> which I alluded to, you've maybe heard of. Okay, so I'm not gonna run this, but you can run it, and as long as you, it, it might not run super quickly um because the model takes a little bit of time to train and you have to make sure you're using a gpu runtime <clears throat> but we basically um set up a virtual environment uh, with our repository we use a pytorch to download the mnist data set um and we set up our model which requires kind of the masking out features during training so we have a little uh, validation set um, this is the model right here it's like a 
at like 12 or 13 layer CNN. Um, and there's this mask layer at the beginning, which we use to mask out features during training. And then we'll mask them out while generating an explanation. <coughs> Um, and here's the training code. Um, we're gonna, well, I set it up to train for 50 epochs um, using Atom to optimize. So we're just doing a stochastic gradient descent and uh, yep, this will train. And then this shows the model's loss improving um, as, the, as you do more epochs of training. Okay. So now after this point, the model has been trained and we want to run a couple different explanation methods. So luckily we've set up the virtual environment. We can import from our explain uh, removal explanations. That's our repository. So remember there are three choices you have to make. You have to choose how to remove features, you have to choose the model behavior that you're going to explain and you have to choose the summary technique. And that's how we've organized the repository. I, I hope that that's intuitive. <coughs> and then um, <coughs> this is, um, we, you know, it's probably not productive for me to talk about every line here, but this is basically um, setting up the model um, so that in, in a format that our backend requires, because, um, you know, there's a different API for scikit-learn models and PyTorch models, et cetera. So we have a sort of unified representation that our backend uh, likes to see. So this is just setting that up. Okay, and now let's move on to actually generating explanations. So uh, we'll start by explaining individual predictions, which means uh, here we've chosen a single image. It is a three, and we're going to uh, calculate feature attributions using a couple different techniques. And we're gonna look at um, how each pixel contributes to the probability of it being a three. And we're also gonna look at how each pixel contributes to the probability of it being an eight. And that's interesting because the threes and eights are differentiated um, <coughs> by the arcs or the um, arcs that are not present on the left-hand side. So here we are, um, using the behavior module um, to set up a set function. Uh, I call it a cooperative game here. Uh, sorry, that's a little... Set functions are the same as cooperative games. Um, anyway, so we're setting up the underlying set function. And then with that, we've chosen how to remove features. We've chosen the model behavior. All that's left is to run one of the summary techniques. So we're going to run three. First, we do the include individual technique. And that means we imagine the difference between the, the prediction that the model would make given access to no features, which is just the base rate prediction. It probably thinks that there's a 10% chance of the digit being a zero, 10% chance of it being a one, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and that will give us some attribution scores and then we can plot them. So here we have it. This is the include individual summary technique. This is how each pixel contributes to it being a three. You can see that, oh, red means that it contributes positively. So this top arc is uh, contributing towards it being a three. Um, this empty space here is contributing to it being a three. A lot of other digits have something here. Uh, this arc on the side is contributing to it being a three. Now, if we look over at the eight, we see some red spots. Um, the, this arc at the bottom is contributing towards it being an eight. Um, but these missing arcs over here, <coughs> these blue spots are showing that it's maybe not an eight. But anyway, that's just one technique. That's the that's the include individual technique. And it kind of fails to account for interactions between different regions. So let's try something else. Um, let's try the remove individual technique. Um, this looks at the difference between the prediction with all the features and the prediction when an individual feature is removed. Um, and this actually also fails to account for uh, interactions. Um, 
but we can run that and then we can plot it. And here's what we see. Um, it doesn't look very good. And I think the reason it doesn't look very good is um, with this way of removing features, um, it's sort of doing what you would want a person to do. If you show someone a digit and you kind of put your hand over one spot, you want them to think, okay, you're not telling me what's in that spot, but I can imagine what's there given what I do get to see. That's kind of what this technique is doing. Uh, later in the slides, I'll talk about that a little bit more formally. But in that setting, um, removing an individual pixel really doesn't make much of a difference, right? So I'd call these very noisy. This is kind of useless. Um, the combination of removing individual features and um, uh, as the summary technique and uh, this particular way of holding out features, which is introducing missingness at training time, does not lead to a good explanation. <clears throat> okay. Lastly, um, here's one other summary technique, the Shapley value. And this does account for interactions between different pixels. And I think this one looks pretty nice. Uh, among the three, I would definitely go with this one. So remember, red means that this is contributing towards it being a three. Um, the fact that this is an empty region also contributes. The fact that there are no arcs here also contributes, but maybe it would help if the three were a little bit thicker. That's what the blue means. And for the eight, these big blue splotches show that that's really ruining it. It can't be an eight because of these blue splotches. And what do we have here? Well, we have emptiness. We don't have arcs there. That's why it's not an eight. But over here, this kind of contributes towards it being an eight, um, as does this, this part around the top, this arc at the top. Um, yeah, so the, there, we, we just compared three different explanation methods. Um, they map onto SHAP, uh, another one called prediction difference analysis. It's PREDDIF. Um, and one, one of them is a new method. You can see it's really easy to just interchange these choices and run different methods. And we'll go through this again with a different model behavior. So now, instead of looking at the prediction itself, we will look at the loss for the prediction given the true label. Uh, well, let's do this one a little bit faster. So here, this digit is a four, right? And the model gets it right. The model knows that it's a four. But as we deprive the model of different features, it could become a little bit confused. If we don't show it, um, you know, the top half of the image, it could easily be a nine, right? So that's what we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at um, how the loss evolves as different features are removed. So since we're explaining a different model behavior here, we set up a different set function um, to look at the model's loss for this digit. And we run three different methods. Uh, we do include individual. And you can see that um, basically the, the red splotches help the case for it being a four. Um, but this is maybe not a perfect explanation uh, because it's not accounting for interactions. You can remove individual features instead. I would call this very noisy because once again, I think removing individual pixels um, does not make a big difference. Um, and here's the Shapley value. And this is a method called loss Shap. Um, and this looks a little bit nicer to me. So you can see kind of roughly the outline of a four contributing to it being a four. You can also see this region at the top is really important. The fact that there is no line there is what differentiates this four from a nine. And this empty, this empty splotch at the bottom, um, you know, if we look at the four, it's kind of obvious that it's not an eight, but if you only saw, you know, parts of it, maybe it could, maybe it could be an eight, but the fact that there's nothing down here really shows that it's not an eight. So that's helpful to the model. It improves the model's loss. So, um, yeah, I, I haven't been checking the chat, but um, are there any, any questions about that, about this quick demo? Yeah, there is, um, there is one question um, uh, here, Ian. So, uh, the Gesupi 
saying, my understanding is that this analysis is done after the model is trained. Are we sure that the results of post-reduced model are always the same or consistent with the results obtained from retraining the model with the reduced feature set? And the second question is, how does this method behave when there are multiple subsets of the features that can predict or explain the data? So let's maybe okay. yeah. I can the second question later, but uh, I can maybe start with the first one. Yeah, let's do the first one. So the first question was basically asking, well, I guess there were a couple parts. One was, is this a post hoc method? Is this a, are these explanations that can be generated after the fact? And um, the answer is yes. Um, all, many, many of these methods, many of the explanation methods in our table are post hoc in the sense that you can take a model, oftentimes any model, there's no restriction on how the model works and you can run an explanation method to see, you know, you can run SHAP on it, you can run Lime on it. Um, <clears throat> there are often no requirements for how the model works. You just train the model, then you can run the explanation methods. The small problem is that um, there are different ways of removing features, right? And I, I would argue that some of those ways are convenient, like replacing, if there's a held out pixel and you just turn it gray because you don't know it, or you turn it black because you don't know it, that is convenient but it has some pretty bad properties. Like, because black just, it means something to the model. You, you don't want the model to necessarily think it's black. What you want is to um, let the model kind of think that it doesn't know that feature. Mm -hmm. And there, there, are different, there are different ways of doing that. Some ways do it better than others. And we hone in on this more in the paper, but, um, there are a handful of techniques that give approximations to this one technique, which is marginalizing out the missing features with their conditional distribution. And that one's sort of the hardest to implement, but it has some pretty good properties. And what we've done here by training a model with missingness at training time, that's one of the approximations to marginalizing out features with their conditional distribution. That's why we've done that here. Um, it's, it was kind of the fastest one to put in this demo, but um, you can absolutely run these methods um, with a model that doesn't have missingness introduced at training time, but you'll need to use some different removal technique. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so ho hopefully that mostly answers that question. Now, um, the second question was, what if there are, oh, and sorry, there's one more thing. Um, <clears throat> the commenter asked about the idea of training different models for each set of features. That is another one. Remember I said there are a couple different methods that approximate marginalizing out features with their conditional distribution. <clears throat> That's one of the other approximations. The problem is we have many subsets of features, right? With 784 features, there are two to the 784 mm -hmm. sets of features. We're never going to train all those models. So that's a feature removal approach that does not work here. It could work with a smaller data set, maybe like 10 features, but not here. <clears throat> yeah. I'll do the second question in a sec. <clears throat> Actually, Shri, sorry, can you repeat the second question? Yeah, so how does, how does this method behave when there are multiple subsets of the features that could explain um, or predict the data? So it's uh, collinear, I don't know, uh, probably right on, you know, a repeat of the same features or incarnations of different features in the data sets. Yeah, so um, the short answer is it depends on the choices that you make. Um, there are different ways of removing features, right? And some of them will account for collinearity, will account for dependencies in between features, right? Um, co for example, collinearity is not accounted for if when you hold out a feature, you just replace it with its mean. Mm -hmm. 
So maybe that's not a good way of removing features. Um, now, the, your choice of summary technique, remember the first, demand, the first choice is how to remove features. The third choice is your summary technique. <coughs> yeah, sorry guys, a little early for me. <laughs> um, so that third choice, your summary technique is also important. As the, as the commenter mentioned with one of the previous slides, if you do the remove individual technique where you just remove an individual pixel, by not looking at every subset of features, it's kind of failing to account for certain interactions. Um, the Shapley value, if you're like really interested in this topic, I'd really recommend looking into the Shapley value because it has some really great properties that in a nutshell, I would say that it's, um, as good of a way as you could come up with to account for the interactions between different features. The Shapley value tries to look at every subset of features. And <clears throat> by looking at every subset, it gives kind of a nuanced summary of how much each feature contributes to the model's uh, performance or each feature's contribution to the prediction. So. Yeah, to summarize really quickly, um, it's not the same for every method. Each choice that you make kind of um, determines how these different interactions are accounted for. So I actually had a, uh, just a curious about a follow up in here. So what in case you do like principal component or some kind of feature reduction and then apply this, what happens? <clears throat> So I guess there are two ways that you could do that. One way would be to um, run PCA and then train a model on your PCs. If you did that and you ran these methods, um, the sort of default thing that they would do is they would tell you, um, they would give you, for example, feature attributions. <clears throat> for each of your PCs. And I had guessed that that's just not what you want. Mm -hmm. you, know, you kind of want to know how important each feature is, not how important each PC is. Um, <clears throat> but alternatively, you could imagine your whole model composing the PCA embedding with like an XGBoost model. And you could sort of run the method back to your features and most of these methods, almost all of these methods are model agnostic. Okay. So there's no problem with that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but I think um, Michaela had another comment. Uh, if the features are not independent, then removal is, uh, if, uh, then removal beta will have the same result. You have to do that. Say that one more time. Um, so I think it was a comment, it was not a question. So if the features are not independent, then removal beta will have the same result. You have to do that. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, you have to do the PCA first. That's what it's gonna say. Oh, well, I don't know. I guess depending on what background you come from, <clears throat> it might be kind of a like maxim in your area that you need to remove collinearity, but um, I guess among machine learning people, they're kind of cowboys. You know, we don't we don't run PCA images or many right. things. We'll just throw it into a model if we have a ton of data. Um, it's yeah. yeah. I guess it depends on the field. Okay, cool. I think there are more questions. Please go ahead. Okay, then let me re-share. Okay, or the slide is showing right. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we just went through this. <clears throat> All right, so let's just summarize wh where we've been so far. Um, <clears throat> we've introduced a new class of methods that we call removal-based explanations. And they're all based on feature removal. Um, with our framework, we showed that all of these methods are specified by different combinations of three choices. <clears throat> And with our framework, because there are three choices, it offers kind of a 
degree of flexibility about how you want to explain your model. You can implement any of those uh, 20, 20 or so existing methods, but there are also you know, hundreds of hybrid methods that you could run and they're all gonna be um, removal-based explanations. <clears throat> so with that, I think I was trying to think of how to segue to the rest of the content from the paper. And um, I think there are kind of two key questions that get brought up after you introduce this framework. And the first one is, since so many methods are built on feature removal, it's important to think about, you know, is feature removal a good approach for model explanation? Because there are different approaches. Is this a good one? And the second question is, since we have to make three choices, and you know, if you make a different choice, you get a different explanation, we should ask ourselves, are there right choices for each dimension? Um, those are the two questions we're gonna... <laughs> okay, so moving on. Um, like I said, there are these two questions that we'll just try to answer uh, in the next couple minutes. And the first one we'll focus on is why feature removal? Why is that a good idea? If so many methods do that, hopefully it's a good idea. Um, so the first thing to say is, um, you know, it's kind of remarkable that without a paper like this, kind of advocating for feature removal as the thing to do, many research groups have gravitated towards it. And that suggests that there's something very intuitive about feature removal. Um, so that alone might suggest that there's something like, from a psychology perspective, that's intuitive about this. But let's also think about what feature removal really means. So feature removal is a form of counterfactual reasoning. And you might have heard of the idea of counterfactual reasoning. Uh, the idea is that you know, in our reality, we have a certain set of facts that occur and that leads to a certain outcome. But to understand the mechanism that leads to that outcome, you could change a couple of facts and observe a different outcome. And by playing with the facts, you can uh, maybe understand the, the mechanisms better. Um, and a feature removal is uh, such a way of, uh, you know, altering the facts to see how the outcome could change. Um, <clears throat> What feature removal does is it kind of undoes the act of observing some information as opposed to changing what was observed. And it imagines um, how the model's behavior changes, how an individual prediction changes. And that's kind of a fancy way of framing it. And to get a little bit fancier, uh, this idea of imagining that something doesn't occur and then seeing how the outcome differs, um, that idea is anchored in psychology where it's called a subtractive counterfactual. And in philosophy, it's called the method of difference. Um, so that's kind of a fancy way of uh, justifying this, but I think it's probably just intuitive to a lot of people that if you, you know, remove the influence that is exerted by a feature and you see what changes, then you kind of understand that feature's influence. So that's what feature removal is really doing. And I can say a couple more words about counterfactual reasoning. So uh, like I said, counterfactuals are changing aspects of a situation to see how the outcome changes. And then we learn about the mechanism that leads to that outcome. And in this case, we are changing the observation of some features values. But alternatively, you could understand a model by changing its inputs and seeing how the output changes. So, <clears throat> If this uh, high dimensional function uh, represents the model's output and we have a point on that manifold and we wanna understand the function a little bit, we would understand the function better if we knew that by changing that one feature, shifting along that axis, we get a different model output. We learn a little something about the function. A human would benefit from that. But does it tell us that much? Because we can perturb this point in any direction. Um, and it's actually a little complicated to explore this space by just changing individual values. Um, and there are a lot of methods. That's actually maybe the other main paradigm. There are a lot of methods that try to generate um, you know, alternative examples that change just one feature value or two feature values and achieve a different output. 
And that does tell you something. Maybe it's even preferable in some settings, but it's not giving you some kind of comprehensive summary of how um, <clears throat> the manifold of model predictions looks. Um, so feature removal is a different kind of counterfactual. It's removing the act of observing some features. And it actually gives a more practical way of exploring and summarizing functions. You kind of sidestep this problem of um, having a very high dimensional, large input domain. Maybe you also want to account for the data distribution. Um, these feature removal methods just give, give you a more practical approach for uh, summarizing what a function looks like. So that that's all we'll say about the about why feature removal. Um, <clears throat> and let's move on to this last question. Of I actually feature. had a question there, Ian. So what happens yeah. if the importance of feature uh, changes or degrades over time, and you're still working with the model which had uh, which was trained on the assumption of those features had a particular level of what, what would happen at that point? Either it could yeah, be that's a good... uh, it could dramatic, or it could be you know something which you know degenerates over time in a slow way. Yeah, well, um, that's a good question. Um, I think so. The premise of the question is that the features are changing, <clears throat> and presumably the model's predictions are kind of changing, and the performance is becoming worse. Um, I think different explanation methods can be applied as model monitoring tools <clears throat> where by looking at the influence of a feature <clears throat> over time, you know, if, if the feature is shifting over time, its distribution is shifting, or if it becomes encoded incorrectly because of some process during data collection, um, explanation methods can actually expose that really quickly. If you look at um, a feature's contribution to the model's performance uh, after it has become encoded incorrectly, then instead of improving the model's performance, you'll see that giving access to that feature actually hurts the model's performance. Um, so um, model explanation methods can expose these kinds of problems. And um, Scott has a paper. Um, it's not the SHAP paper, it's a different one that looks at a model monitoring application um, of SHAP. And in the SAGE paper, we have an experiment where we look at a model monitoring example where we encoded a feature incorrectly, the performance becomes really bad, but then we look at each feature's contribution to the performance and it just jumps out that there's one feature that hurts the model's performance. Um, sure. So yeah, maybe, maybe explanation tools can actually be uh, a remedy for such problems. Yeah. All right. So, about these right choices. So, Sorry, I just ask me another question. So, are there specific metrics you would advocate for measuring those, or how would you how would you, you know, factor the uh, how do you quantify the degradation? Maybe. Um. You would. I mean, well, based on this next section, the way, like the choices that I would advocate for, um, I would, I don't wanna, you know, be like self-marketing too much, but if you just run Sage on a model um, with a feature that's encoded incorrectly and you look at the, you look at the attributions for each feature, each feature gets a score and the score is in units of the model's loss or you could make it in units of accuracy or whatever. And uh, that's your metric. If you just make a bar chart, you'll see that many features have positive contributions and the one feature or the multiple features that are encoded incorrectly will have negative scores showing that they hurt the model's performance. So that's a really straightforward way of uh, quantifying it. But if you don't wanna run Sage, maybe you don't wanna use Shapley values, you could um, you know, start at Sage, but then change a couple choices um, is, like we showed, it's you could run a permutation test, for example. A permutation mm -hmm. test would also expose that by removing a feature, removing access to it, maybe the model's performance actually improves. Okay, well, thank yeah. you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so about these right choices, are there right choices? So 
recall that we, with our framework, we showed that there are a bunch of methods that fall into this framework and they are determined by different combinations of three choices. And these choices matter. If you make a different choice, you get a different explanation. And we want useful explanations. We should ask, are there right choices? Are there wrong choices? And right and wrong is kind of a strong word. So um, I'd say that every method kind of has something to offer. Every method says something about how the model works. Some choices are maybe more justified than others though. And uh, with different choices, there are conceptual trade-offs. <clears throat> maybe one accounts for feature interactions better, but there are also computational trade-offs. Accounting for feature interactions properly could take 10 times as long. So these are the different trade-offs that you have. So <clears throat> right is too strong of a word, but we will, I, I will sort of advocate for a couple choices that I think are particularly interesting. So when it comes to removing features, is there a right thing to do? So if you marginalize out features with their conditional distribution, this leads to some pretty good properties. And this is the, the choice for this dimension that we kind of hone in on in the paper. It turns out um, <clears throat> if you like, if you kind of read, if you read the paper and you think about what this really means, you will see that this is a very hard approach to implement. Um, the good news is that there are a bunch of approaches that give good approximations. And the one that we showed in the notebook, where if you happen to have trained a model that has missingness introduced at training time, that approximates marginalizing out features with their conditional distribution. That's good news. Um, and if you do this, then the explanations that you generate are in a formal sense, you could call them information theoretic explanations. They connect to ideas from information theory, like mutual information. <clears throat> so let's look a little bit more closely at what that means, removing features with their conditional distribution. So intuitively, think of like a chest x-ray. You go to your doctor, your doctor says, um, I actually, I don't think this has anything to do with COVID, but it's interesting. People can now diagnose a COVID from chest x-rays. So maybe you go to your doctor and they say, you have COVID. And you're like, oh my God, how do you know I have COVID? You might want to black out different regions of the image and see, is there a region where if I black it out, the doctor says, um, I don't think you have COVID. Then maybe the evidence is contained in that region. So you could do this. You could put a little black box over one region and go to your doctor and say, what do you think now? And the doctor can interpret this in different ways. <clears throat> and the doctor could say, oh my God, there's something really weird going on with you. You have a completely black splotch in your chest. Or they could say, um, the machine is malfunctioned. I don't know what's going on here, but there's a black splotch here. Or they could say, I understand that you're basically blocking out this region and you're not telling me what's there, but using my knowledge of everything else that you've given me access to. And the fact that I've seen many scans before, I can kind of imagine what's there. Um, that's intuitively what I would say uh, doing this conditional distribution thing means. Uh, but more formally, <clears throat> this is what it means. You're averaging the model's output over different values of the held out features and you're weighting it according to the conditional distribution. And the reason that's hard is that you don't typically have access to the conditional distribution. And that's why we um, would need to use different approximation approaches. So if that seems interesting, then you might be interested in reading um, section eight in the paper. Um, and really quickly, I'll just flash this. I said that the explanations become information theoretic if you remove features that way. Um, here is the sense in which that happens. Here we list a bunch of different methods. We group them in a certain way and we say that certain ones are related to the pointwise mutual information. Some are related to the KL divergence, some are related to mutual information. Um, so this is a good, this is actually, I think, kind of an important thing because there are a lot of explanation methods out there. Um, and we want something that's more than a heuristic. We want an explanation that kind of means something. And this shows that when your choices align in a, speci in a specific way, your explanation means something. Yeah. Um, was, there, was there a question? No, I don't think so. Uh, 
Uh, actually, um, there's a question. Is there a causal connection here? Uh, you know, kind of looking at uh, causal inference methods, I guess, Judea Pearl is common. Um, <clears throat> hmm. Is there anything causal going on here? <clears throat> well, of all the methods that are unified by our framework that you can see in that in that table that I showed several slides ago, so that table is also in the paper. Um, none of those methods really make a compelling claim to being causal. Um, one one kind of claims to be causal, but in a very limited sense, sort of like it makes kind of a tortured argument where it says, you know, we're looking at how changing a feature causes the model's output to change. Um, so in that sense, it's causal, but it's not really looking at causality between the features and the true response variable. Um, so the short answer is that these methods don't really have a lot to do with causality, but in the recent um, NeurIPS conference, there was a paper that sort of touched on uh, how to merge um, SHAP with uh, causality and to make a, again, to distill a paper down to something very short. It basically introduces a different technique for removing features that uses Judea Pearl's do operator. The paper is called causal Shapley values Mm -hmm. And um, it's very recent, so I haven't like heard too many people talk about it, and we haven't seen whether people are going to, you know, move towards that. Um, but it's kind of challenging, right? Because it kind of requires knowledge of the causal graph. So you need to be able to model interventions properly. Um, all that becomes really complicated with uh, purely observational data. Um, but the really short answer is that most of these methods are not really related to Judea Pearl's notions of causality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we just talked about the different feature removal techniques. Um, let's move on to the second choice, model behavior. Is there a right model behavior to be looking at? No, um, any choice will provide valuable information about how the model works. Um, <clears throat> the different model behaviors that you can look at I think it's fair to say, just to give you a range of perspectives about how how the model depends on different features. Um, and the, the right thing to look at basically just depends on your use case, but there's no way you could say that um, one of these model behaviors is somehow uh, less interesting than another. It just depends on your use case. Okay, and lastly, the summary technique, the third choice, is there a right summary technique to use? Well. Um, you know, the commenters mentioned at the previous slide, it looks like certain summary techniques don't really account for feature interactions very well. Um, that is true. There's a lens that you can use. There's basically a bunch of research that has been done in a different field that maps kind of perfectly onto this question of how to summarize the underlying set function. And that field is cooperative game theory. Um, if you, if you, Basically, it's like not the branch of game theory that comes to mind, probably. For some reason, uh, non-cooperative game theory is a lot more popular. But cooperative game theory is basically a part of game theory that really studies set functions. And one of the big questions they try to answer is with set functions. And you, you, the reason I talked about employees earlier is you can think of them abstractly as we have a set of employees when each set of employees participates, we make a certain amount of profit. And then cooperative game theory, one of the big questions they try to answer is, how do we compensate each of the employees? Like, how do we, how do we represent each employee's contribution to the company? Um, maybe because we want to, you know, offer them beforehand as some kind of compensation to encourage them to participate, or maybe everyone's participating and we want to just to give everyone a bonus. We want to distribute the profits in a fair way um, to account for how much everyone has contributed. Cooperative game theory really looks into questions like that. And it turns out that because we are looking at set functions and we're trying to look at each feature's role in determining the model's predictions, these things from cooperative game theory map on perfectly 
in every summary technique that these different methods use has a precedent in cooperative game theory. And we we have a whole section in the paper that just shows um, basically what, the, what they're all called in cooperative game theory. And what's important about this is because there's so much research in this area, the game theoreticians have laid out a bunch of different potential properties that different uh, summary techniques might satisfy. A lot of properties that we might want to satisfy. And a lot of the summary techniques that are used do satisfy some of these properties. Um, but the Shapley value, which was not invented by a model explanation person, it's actually just ported over from game theory because uh, luckily some smart people realized that that was there. It satisfies the largest number of these desirable properties. And um, <clears throat> again, I'll, I'll kind of spare you the details, but the Shapley value has a couple axioms that if you want to satisfy those three axioms, the Shapley value is the only thing you can do. That's a big reason why people like Shap. Um, and uh, again, I'm going to direct you to the paper, but this is the equation for the Shapley value. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see that there, there's a summation. It's actually a weighted average. It's not, that's not obvious that it's a weighted average, but it is a weighted average over these differences between a coalition of features or a set of features and the value for that same set of features when you add the i feature. It's sort of the, the little delta that you get for adding the i feature. But we take a weighted average of that over all the different sets you could add i to. And that is the attribution score that you give to the i feature when you calculate the Shapley value. And that's why you could say that it accounts for interactions much better than the alternative techniques. So this is a scenario where I might say that the Shapley value is more justified uh, than the other choices that you could make. And the other choices will satisfy a subset of the Shapley values properties, but not all of them. Yeah. All right. And, um, oh yeah, so I mentioned that they all, all the different techniques have some precedent in cooperative game theory. Um, here's a table, I'm just flashing it. I don't expect you to read through the whole thing, but you can see uh, if you wanna read the paper, what the precedent is for uh, all these different techniques um, and what the different potentially desirable properties are that the Shapley value happens to satisfy. All right, and with that, we'll just move on to just quick quick conclusions and then open it up for some more questions. So we, with this, with this paper, with this talk, presented basically a new perspective for understanding um, a bunch of explainability tools. We unified many methods under one pretty simple framework that just breaks it down to three choices you have to make. That's the recipe for making a new explanation method. And we can see that many papers although they weren't thinking in terms of this framework, um, do fall into this framework. So it consolidates a lot of the literature down to a couple simple ideas. Uh, in doing so, we developed some rigorous foundations in terms of game theory, in terms of information theory uh, that weren't there for explainability. And uh, with, with that, we hope that we can better inform practitioners about the tools that are available to them, make it a little easier to understand the trade-offs between different options, and uh, also hope that we can guide some researchers in fruitful directions with the, with the new perspective that we've uh, introduced here. So uh, yeah, let me know what kinds of questions you have at this point. Cool. Um, so I think there's one uh, question regarding whether removal is like intervention. Okay, yeah, so intervention is kind of a causality term. Um, <coughs> And that causal Shapley values paper, like I said, it basically suggests a different way of removing features. And its way of removing features involves an intervention in a causal sense. Here, all the methods that we've talked about, all the methods that are in that table are using removal strategies that do not uh, really have anything to do with interventions in a causal sense. Cool. And then uh, I think there's a related question. Are there links 
with this framework and causal inference, which I think we have done. Uh, and if, if there was any kind of uh, specific links you observed within this framework and causal inference, if there are any. Yeah, okay, well, there's a lot of interest in this. Let me see if there's anything else I can say. Um, um, so, yeah, like I said, the, the early years of explainability that produced all of these papers didn't have a lot to do with causality, right? Causal Shapley values is a really recent paper um, and it tries to create more of a link with uh, causality research. That said, there have been um, some arguments in the past about how you can maybe interpret um, SHAP in terms of causality. Um, there's a paper by this guy, uh, Jansing, it was written uh, J-A-N-Z-I-N-G. I think it's called um, like model explanation, a causality question, something like that. And mm -hmm. it, makes, it makes an argument that um, I think if you really know about causality, you won't find it very compelling, um, but it makes an argument for how SHAP could maybe be viewed as an approximation to something causal. Um, but if you're very knowledgeable about causality um, and you're now very knowledgeable about explainability. Uh, maybe this uh, could be some stuff that you look into. Cool. So I actually had a question about, uh, you know, how do we operationalize this in the context of an enterprise, right? So you know, you've worked in a couple of uh, you know, financial companies and you know the ecosystem there, right? So you have the model developers and you have the fiduciary responsibilities and you have a model risk management department and you have multiple departments who are supposedly to Kind of nurture the model when it's kind of going through development, production, deployment, you know, retirement, ownership, you know, all the all the things which needs to be factored in. Now, uh, explainability has been in the news significantly in the news in the last at least year or so, and uh, in the financial industry context or even in other industry contexts, I know everybody is kind of grappling with like. Who do we explain to? You know, how do you define explainability versus interpretability? And as you were kind of presenting this whole grid of different approaches which are out there, uh, there is a plethora of options on what you want to choose. So I was, I was just kind of wondering, like, you know, what's your thought process in terms of applications? You know, just kind of going beyond the scientific and the, the rigorous framework. How do you operationalize this? And what what are kind of um, approaches you would advocate for operationalizing some of these methodologies in the enterprise? <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, the million dollar question. Huh? And uh, you know, I've been kind of on the purely academic side for um, several years now. So I'm probably not the best equipped person to be, you know, among all the people you have uh, to come talk here. <laughs> there are probably people who can answer that a lot better than I can. But <clears throat> I guess with my perspective that um, you know you're not really choosing between lime and lime and shap. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need to be constrained to those tools. This this shows that you can easily make a hybrid between any any of these methods, right? And with that flexibility comes you know the power to do what you want. That it also comes with uh, the responsibility to now maybe think a little bit harder about w what are your goals really? Um, do you want to understand the value of your different data modalities so that you can choose which data providers to rely on? Do you want to um, you know, prove to auditors that your models aren't relying on features that it shouldn't be relying on? Do you want to show something to users to maybe give them some, um, you know, give them the impression that there's some kind of uh, recourse they could take or that there are some uh, changes they could make to their profile to become a more appealing uh, you know, candidate for a loan, for example. Um, <clears throat> as we understand our tools better, and we like, you know, when we when we take this perspective that it's not choosing between a couple monolithic approaches, but really we have the flexibility to answer any question we want. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you now really need to think a little bit harder about what that question is, um, and. Yeah, I don't know if I if I can if I were still working in one of those companies, maybe I'd have better insight into uh, 
you know, what it really is that people should be caring about. Probably at some point, um, regulators will become a little bit more active in ensuring that, you know, because there are processes right now to make sure that employees aren't doing something racist, for example. Down the line, maybe there will be some um, analogous processes to make sure that models aren't exhibiting some kind of unfair bias. And I would bet that whatever approach they use to um, test that down the line can be framed in terms of <clears throat> a removal-based explanation. Okay. So I was kind of more thinking in the context of, you know, let's say, um, I mean, explaining is one aspect, but why are we explaining is the important aspect in the industry, right? Um, there has to be some goal. So for example, let's say, you know, a particular feature is extremely important to making decisions. And, you know, if you, if you are able to attribute a lot of explanation to that particular feature, then I'm going to take extra precaution to make sure that the processing pipeline, the data processing pipelines, which gets in the features, how are we doing missing values? And how are we kind of, you know, using proxies or even soliciting it from, you know, end users, credit card applications, you know, how much due diligence should I be doing if someone reports a particular FICO score, for example, right? Um, so those would be the practical things I would kind of, you know, operationalize saying, hey, this particular feature is uh, going to significantly impact the outcome. Um, so uh, that, that, in, in that way, I was kind of thinking, you know, how could practitioners be looking at these and kind of tie it back to the whole pipeline from, you know, where do we get the data to actually where the models are going to be used for making decisions? Uh... Yeah, well, yeah, if that's, you know, if the goal is kind of to understand the sensitivities of your model to different features and which features are really driving your model's performance, uh, removal-based explanations do provide the flexibility to really hone in on that question. And um, yeah, I think that's to totally uh, like a valid uh, focus for explainability within an enterprise uh, today. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think there's one more question, maybe we should wrap up and uh, we'll probably have one last question. So the question by Matt is, can you apply this framework to understand dependence between features? For example, repeat the removal process if you like, perhaps the same features, maybe even in, in a different order to understand the dependence or correlation between features. So we kind of touched upon, you know, the dependence, interdependence between features, but uh, the question is, can you use this to understand the dependency between different features? Um, yeah, you know, if if what you want is to understand the dependencies between your features, like that's really the question you want to answer, <clears throat> then I'd say um, applying an explanation method to understand your model is kind of an indirect way of getting at it. Um, <laughs> But um, I, I will say, since you mentioned the idea of removing features in different orders to kind of understand their, their interactions a little bit better, um, that is um, sort of this, remember how we said that removing individual features, it's a very uh, coarse, unnuanced way of looking at a feature's contribution, right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so th the idea of removing all the features in a particular ordering, and then maybe trying doing it in a different order. And for each order, you can kind of see at the time that you remove a feature, what's the delta that it creates? It matters what you've removed before that, right? Well, the Shapley value takes that to its logical extreme where you try all, you remove the features in every possible ordering and you look at the delta created by a feature and you average it across every possible ordering, that is exactly what the Shapley value is. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why I would say that, um, you know, for this third choice, the summary technique that you use, the Shapley value uh, conceptually is pretty, pretty superior to a lot of its alternatives. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So I actually, well, maybe, maybe one follow-up question and we'll, we'll kind of, you know, adjourn for the day. One is, uh, have you looked at any, you know, uh, computational overheads for your method? And um, the second question is, uh, what's kind of the roadmap for extension to your current work? Uh, maybe even factoring multiple features at a time or, I don't know, if you had any thoughts there. 
Um, okay, the first question about uh, computational overhead. So I alluded to this in a not very specific way that with each of the three choices that you're making, some choices have um, conceptual benefits, some choices have computational benefits. Um, in most cases, to get something that is conceptually more appealing, you'll have to spend a little more computation. And the Shapley value is, in fact, so so conceptually strong that it's effectively impossible to calculate exactly. Mm -hmm. So if you're really interested in this stuff and you look into SHAP or you look into different methods that are based on Shapley values, you will discover that they're all based on approximation approaches. Um, and the approximations are a fantastic improvement over exact calculations, but those methods are still a bit slower than their alternatives. Um, they're, they're really pretty good though. So I don't know how to frame whether it's like fast enough or not fast enough. Um, I, I think they are pretty manageable. Um, but yeah, there's, there's an overhead to doing something uh, more uh, conceptually justified. And then the roadmap for extensions, um, I don't know, this is so recent that we really haven't really thought about the next steps, but I imagine that um, <clears throat> There are a bunch of other methods out there that are also removal-based explanations in a sense that we haven't noticed. Um, and I think that uh, actually one of the things on my agenda is to look at this question of um, fairness, uh, yeah. you know, fairness and mitigating bias. Um, I imagine, you know, I'm not a practitioner, so what do I know? But I can imagine that in the not too distant future, uh, as machine learning and AI become more widespread, uh, companies either on their own or due to regulators or auditing firms are gonna have to begin thinking very precisely about how to quantify bias to make sure that there are training models that um, are maybe even less biased than the humans that implement these processes yeah. right now. And I think that, um, like, like I alluded to earlier, I think that ultimately um, the way to align explainability ideas with um, existing ideas in the fairness literature will be through this class of explanations, removal-based explanations, because you really kind of want to see, um, you know, what is the contribution of one of these sensitive features to the model's performance or its performance, or is it sensitive to that feature? Um, and just intuitively, you'd probably want it to not be sensitive to those features, but even things like a disparate impact if you're if you've like read about fairness, a disparate impact or statistical parity, those can all of those ideas can be framed in terms of removal based explanations. So yeah. yeah, thanks so much, Ian. This was an absolute pleasure, and thanks for taking the time and uh, waking up early for us. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I can see the sun already has risen in your area. Uh, you know, you yeah. kind of see it in the window. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time and uh, for people who are listening in, uh, as I mentioned, the reference to the paper and also the code uh, Ian shared uh, is available at the link on the sandbox. If you have any direct questions, I also have put in Ian's contact information. Uh, he's uh, on LinkedIn, so you should be able to contact him. Um, so next week is gonna be the final lecture of the year. So not to be missed, it's uh, about the API jungle and we're gonna talk about how the world is changing with respect to the use of various APIs. And uh, also we are gonna give you some, uh, uh, we're gonna have a small raffle and also talk about some of the courses which are coming up in Q1. And if you're interested to know more, do go to www.quantuniversity.com. We have a brand new site and you should be able to check out some of the courses and also access the many lectures we've been doing. And if you have any questions or comments, please email us as info at qsandbox.com and someone will respond back to you. Thank you so much. And uh, if we don't see you till January, I wish you a very happy and a prosperous 2021 and enjoy your holidays. Thank you again, Ian, and I'll see you in a bit. Thank you, bye-bye. Yeah, thank you for having me, appreciate it. Thanks, bye-bye. <clears throat>